And hi, everyone. Great to be with you. Thanks for joining. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's been a historic day for the James Webb Space Telescope. They just uh, finished uh, on the very last uh, of a series of very complicated uh, deployment steps, and uh, they're celebrating at NASA. Uh, so we'll touch on that a little bit uh, during the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my presentation here. And uh, let's dive in and, and talk about uh, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. It's, this has been in development for, I think, about 20 years or more. Um, it's a very complicated uh, $10 billion project uh, taken on by NASA, along with partnership uh, partnerships with the European Space Agency, the ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency. So uh, as many of you probably saw they launched the telescope on December 25th and NASA sent out this very cute tweet. I thought uh, that was nice to say, Merry Christmas, everyone. We got you a new telescope. So uh, I'm going to cover four uh, different areas today uh, in about a half hour, maybe 35 minutes, and I'm going to leave a lot of uh, time at the end uh, for Q&A. So as, as, I, as we're going along, please uh, feel free to type, uh, start typing questions in the Q&A section. Uh, there should be, there will be a button for that uh, in, your, in your Zoom window. And i um, like to hear a lot about, you know, what you're thinking and, um, you know, have a little discussion uh, at the end. So uh, I'm going to first talk about how uh, James, the telescope came to be, and then look at the parts uh, that are going to, you know, achieve all this great science, uh, touch a little bit on the new technologies that were invented solely for the, the Webb telescope, and then look at where the telescope is right now. So who was James Webb? Well, he was NASA's second administrator. He served under the Kennedy and Lincoln administrations and oversaw uh, the Apollo landings and the Apollo program for NASA. And, you know, that was, of course, a great success. And uh, he was recognized for uh, coordinating all that work and overseeing that work uh, by having uh, the telescope named after him. And why are they building this telescope? Well, there's four areas uh, of concentration, really. Um, they'll be looking, uh, the web's going to be looking much farther back into time than the Hubble Space Telescope can. And by doing that, uh, the scientists are going to, uh, from all over the world, are going to be getting a better understanding of the formation of the early universe. It's going to be uh, looking back to about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And uh, while they're looking at that, they'll be also looking at galaxies uh, and the early galaxy development and how those galaxies that we see in our sky today uh, came to be uh, how they are right now. And I'll also be looking at the formation of early stars. As a, a bit of a side project, when uh, they first started conceiving the, the James Webb, um, they hadn't discovered uh, planets around other stars, but uh, since in the last 10 years, they found thousands of what we call extrasolar planets. Those are planets uh, orbiting around stars inside our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the web is gonna be able to detect composition of the atmospheres of those planets and give us uh, a, a good idea of whether those certain planets could have life on them or not. So looking at uh, the early universe component, um, this graphic is from Nature Magazine, shows the Big Bang there at the right, and then time uh, going from right over to the left. And the green line indicates about how far back in time the Hubble Space Telescope was able to see, and that goes to about 500 million years after the Big Bang. Um, because of the design and uh, special uh, components of the Webb Space Telescope, the Webb's going to actually be able to see much farther. And this was really the objective of the project, is to take that next step back in time and give us uh, a much better understanding of the, the formation of the universe and how it led to where we are now. Um, and then a great benefit is, is studying these exoplanets uh, outside uh, our solar system. Um, they've, through a, a few different missions, uh, they've now determined that on average, 
there are more that most stars have more than one planet orbiting around it. So um, another way to think of that is if you look up at the night sky on a clear night and you see thousands of stars, you can think to yourself there's actually more planets out there than there are stars. And that's just within our Milky Way galaxy. And in the universe, there's hundreds of billions of galaxies. So we're only seeing you know, a very tiny part of the universe. So uh, Webb's uh, unique components. Um, uh, first of all, the primary mirror is a very unique design. It's 18 gold-plated segments, uh, each in a hexagon shape. Uh, and those are the main light uh, gathering uh, components of the telescope. The light, as it's gathered by the primary mirror, the primary mirror has a soft kind of bowl shape to it. So the light that comes in is focused out to a point uh, at the secondary mirror, and then the, the light bounces off the secondary mirror and into the cone shape uh, uh, structure there you see at the center of the telescope. Uh, all the scientific instruments are behind the mirror in the cool part of uh, the telescope. Uh, critical for the web to be able to view these objects so far back in time is uh, shielding the telescope components from the heat of the sun. Uh, the telescope's not going to be in Earth orbit, it's actually be, going to be a million miles away from Earth. And even that far away, uh, the, sun, uh, the sun side of the telescope could be as hot as 180 degrees, almost enough to boil water. Um, while the cold side, the shady side, that's never going to be facing the sun, where the mirror uh, is and all the scientific instruments, that'll be as cold as minus 380 degrees. Uh, so it's really critical to isolate those components away from sunlight. And uh, it's using solar panels there in the sunlit side and an antenna for talking to Earth. Uh, I was able to visit Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland in 2016. And uh, here's a few pictures from my visit there. Uh, Goddard was where they did all the final assembly of the telescope. And for me, seeing it there was really uh, astounding. It, it, looking at the size, the, the complexity of the telescope there, it seemed to me that uh, <clears throat> it was audacious that NASA was you know, planning to do this launch. This telescope with so many different parts, so many fragile parts, so many unique parts on a rocket that's gonna have a lot of vibration and uh, they're gonna launch it a million miles away and have it operate a million miles away from Earth. So uh, there you can see the primary mirror at the bottom and the secondary mirror uh, up at the top. Here's a close up of uh, two of the technicians uh, doing some work there at the secondary mirror. That's about uh, two feet in diameter, that mirror. And here's a few minutes later with the technicians lowered uh, down closer to the primary to the to the primary mirror, uh, the assembly of uh, the 18 individual mirrors. And what I like about this photo is that if you look closely, you can see the curvature in the primary mirrors. Like I said, it's kind of bowl shaped. So as the light comes into the telescope, it's focused out to a point. And that's you know what telescopes do. They gather light and they focus light that hits at the large surface area down to a point where you have an eyepiece or instruments uh, that uh, capture the light. Um, you could also see, uh, if you look closely, the reflection of the rest of the room in the mirror segments. So over on the left, you see reflection of uh, the boom where the technicians are riding, and you can see the underside of the deck that's uh, above the technician. So yes, it's a, uh, you know, it's a reflecting mirror. And here's a, here's a step back looking at the entire uh, clean room where they did the assembly. And um, that in itself at Goddard was a, as a unique construction. That's a super clean room. Uh, the technicians are scrubbed with a, like an air wash every time they go in and out. And uh, it's very complex just creating the room where you can assemble uh, something like the telescope uh, without having any dust or uh, you know, other particles interfering with it. So uh, how does light reach the instruments? So um, 
it's actually bent and folded uh, a number of times. As the light comes in here depicted on the right, it, it strikes the, the primary mirror and it gets bent to a uh, point uh, we'll, uh, and then reflects off the secondary mirror that's uh, way about 60 feet away, I think, out from the primary mirror. And then the secondary mirror continues uh, focusing the light down through uh, the aperture there in the middle of the telescope and into the science instruments in the back. Um, One of the essential things about creating the Webb telescope has been inventing technologies that have never been used before. And that was actually uh, a cause of some of the delays. They were actually hoping to have the telescope launched many years ago, but as all these very complex uh, technologies were being developed, uh, you know, they needed more time with that. So one of them, of course, was these, these 18 mirror segments and assembling those, figuring out what, what, uh, uh, what components, what um, materials those segments could be made out of. They actually tried several different things. There in the bottom left, you see the back of one of the mirrors. So the, the mirrors themselves are actually made of beryllium, which they found is a very stable uh, substance at the super cold temperatures where um, web is going to be operating. You don't want to have, uh, you know, a material that's going to be flexing at all. Um, and, um, so that in itself was, uh, a major, uh, innovation. And then separate from that, each of the mirrors has seven motors on the back of it. So there's 18 mirrors, 18 segments, each with seven motors. And one thing, now that this telescope's deployed, uh, the main thing they'll be focusing on for the next two weeks is aligning those mirrors. So those mirrors, some, uh, there's actually, they're actually set back about a quarter inch. So they had to invent these specialized motors uh, to keep the mirrors a little bit away from each other during launch so they wouldn't contact and have damage. And they're gonna move the mirrors forward a little bit and then align them up and down, left and right. <clears throat> so that they act uh, as, as one solid surface. And once they get that all aligned, it'll be you know, correct to within like one ten thousandth, uh, or like a fraction of a human hair. So down at the nan nanometer scale, it'll be, you know, they expect it to be just, you know, the, the perfect curve. Um, <clears throat> other parts, uh, are, here uh, on the right is what they call the back plane, the, the, the location where the mirrors are, are set. And that's uh, all new materials, carbon fiber and other things. And then knowing that they had to protect it from the sun, uh, there's this five layer sun shield. That was one of the more most complex uh, components of the mirror of the telescope to deploy. Um, that's actually about the size of a tennis court. Um, also, along with that, um, all new instruments for detecting the light and accomplishing the, the science they're, that they're looking at, uh, all kinds of electronics that are operating at minus 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and you know thousands of uh, these shutter arrays, micro shutters, so that as the light comes in, it could be separated out uh, to different instruments. So these four instruments all work in the infrared part of the uh, electromagnetic scale, not, not visible light, but next to visible light in the infrared. So I'm going to take a closer look at the mid-infrared -inf instrument. And here's an interesting animation from the European Space Agency that shows the path of the light as it enters this instrument. And this is one of four instruments. So there's a mirror at the top that uh, picks off uh, the light stream and each each of the four instruments uh, can pick off uh, the light stream. And as it enters the instrument, you can see it's bent and folded and it's split here into different parts so that different uh, detectors can analyze the light and the components of the light. Um, they're doing... Uh, 
imaging in the infrared and spectroscopy. So with a spectroscope, um, they were able to tell the chemical components of whatever object they're looking at. Um, again, in these, uh, you know, all, all unique and invented just for the Webb telescope. So um, <clears throat> moving on to the launch, and uh, we'll talk about uh, where, where Webb is today. Here's a great photo from French Guiana, uh, where the European Space Agency has its main launch site. Uh, it's there in Northern South, South America. Uh, and one of the reasons that it's there is because it's close to the equator. And whenever you're launching something into space, you like to be co close to the equator because the, uh, the Earth's rotation is about a thousand miles an hour at the equator. And if you launch in the direction that the Earth is rotating, you get a thousand miles an hour bonus uh, on your acceleration. So uh, you can see here in the photo, uh, some of the primary mirror segments facing us uh, in, the, in the center. Um, there are two wings on each side of the telescope that hold, each hold three of the segments. They had to do this uh, in order to fit all those, all the telescope components inside the nose cone of the rocket. And then the pinkish, silverish uh, uh, object you see in front, those are the sun shields that fold down. And uh, there's another one in the back. And there at the very top left, the kind of black round object is this uh, secondary mirror. And we'll uh, have a video coming up um, where we'll have a look at um, the deployment sequence. So uh, here's the nose cone of the rocket being lowered over the telescope. You can get an idea of the size of that by looking at the technicians down there in their yellow suits. That actually only happened about a couple of weeks before launch. Um, and there's the rocket out on the launch pad. and the launch on Christmas day. You know, that uh, was very successful. In fact, it was so successful that um, it actually uh, it was, ended up being a very, very precise uh, path that the launch rocket put this telescope on. So precise that uh, the, the telescope itself is not going to need to do as many corrections along the way, which saves the telescope fuel, which allows it to, to do science for much longer. So that was, that was a, a great benefit of, of the launch. Um, here's a great photo uh, from the rocket. Uh, it's the last view anyone, any humans will ever have of James Webb telescope as it uh, leaves, uh, leaves Earth. There's the, uh, that's the Arabian Sea there at the top center and the Horn of Africa top right in Saudi Arabian Peninsula there at the center right. <clears throat> so where's Webb going? It's like I said, it's not gonna be in Earth orbit or anywhere even near the moon's orbit. There's too much heat uh, from the Earth and interference, radio interference. Um, so it's moving out to a point uh, outside Earth's orbit about a million miles away called a Lagrange point, and this is the Lagrange point two. It's a location in space where there's equal balance between Earth's gravity and the sun's gravity. And the benefit of that is that if you put a spacecraft there, um, it can maintain its position there without burning fuel or having to uh, adjust itself. Um, <clears throat> You can see in uh, in the draw in the image. There's also an L1 point. L1 is on the sun side of the Earth, also about a million miles away. And it's not new to put spacecraft there. There are I think three or four spacecraft right now at L1, and I think a couple at L2 with more planned to go out there. Um, one advantage of being at the L1 point is that you can look at the Earth 24/7. Uh, and you're seeing the sunlit side of the Earth. So there's a great mission called Discover that actually is put to, uh, has time lapse videos where you can see the rotation of the Earth, uh, you know, over over days, and uh, they're very interesting. Uh, there's a series of deployment steps uh, shown here, um, and that last one, their primary primary mirror deployed 
that's the one they finished uh, just about an hour ago, and uh, they're they're uh, they're celebrating at NASA today. Um, one thing you'll notice about the orbit is that at the bottom right, it's showing that the orbit of the web is not a single point; it's it's a circle, and um, that's in part because they don't want the telescope to ever be in Earth's shadow, which would which could uh, disrupt the solar power and communications. So interesting, uh, interesting thing that they're doing with that. Uh, here's another depiction of the Lagrange points. Um, any two body system has these. There's uh, Lagrange points for the Jupiter and the sun. Um, no, there's no spacecraft that have been to L4, or L5, or L3, um, but uh, Jupiter has a, a series of asteroids, some ahead of it at L4, some behind it at L5, that travel in a stable orbit uh, like uh, with Jupiter around the sun. Uh, here's a great video of the deployment steps. So um, just uh, squeezing those, it's really about 14 days of uh, deployment steps. Um, you know, that were critical and there were you know, hundreds of critical, you know, single point failures that were possible, uh, especially related to uh, opening up the sunscreen or the sun shield. So right after launch, they deployed the solar panels so they could uh, start generating power. Uh, still within uh, the first day, they did a, a rocket bird to adjust its trajectory and folded out the antenna so it could talk to Earth. Starting about day three, they unfolded the, the, the front sun shield and back sun shield, raised the telescope up a little bit, uh, unfolded a flap on day five for stability, and then through days five and six, they rolled out the, the sun shield and these, the, the mylar uh, components of the sun shield. <clears throat> this was involved a lot of wires and pulleys and stretching it out. And that was really something that a lot of people were worried about because this was critical for that to happen. Day 11, which was, I think, Tuesday, they unfolded the secondary mirror. Uh, and then they swung out the, the primary uh, mirror segments on both sides. That happened Friday, uh, yesterday, and today. So uh, as of today, we have a fully configured telescope on its way out to L2. One of the things I wanted to, to, to bring up is to give you all a better understanding of how things travel in space. And <clears throat> I'm going to illustrate that by looking at the speed uh, that the telescope is going to be traveling at on its way out to L2. And I highlighted here uh, a few uh, moments um, uh, that show how fast Webb was traveling at any certain time. So <clears throat> this is a, there's a great app on the web. We'll look at it later called Where is Webb? And it'll show you how far away it is, how fast it's traveling. So if you looked at Webb just a couple of hours after launch, it was traveling about 10,000, almost 11,000 miles an hour. But gravity is working on it the entire time. The fastest it's going to be going is <clears throat> right when the rocket stops, uh, stops its firing. And then after that, gravity from the Earth is pulling on Webb the entire time. There's really no such thing as zero gravity. Although you hear that term a lot, and a lot of people think that, oh, astronauts uh, in space are feeling the effects of gravity. That's not correct. Uh, gravity's pervasive. It's always there. It's holding the moon and its orbit around the Earth, and anything that's traveling through space is affected by gravity. And gravity uh, is, in effect, pulling back on any spacecraft as it leaves Earth. So you can see, nine hours after launch, it was going about 7,200 miles an hour, and just a, less than half a day after launch, it had dropped uh, more than half of its speed that it had just two hours after after launch. So. That uh, to me is amazing that you know the, the engineers are doing all those calculations to figure out uh, exactly how fast, how much velocity to add, and, and uh, get the the telescope out to L two. Uh, 
here's some more data uh, from the first day, from six days, and then from yesterday. And uh, you can see at the very bottom, the, the speed dropping off to 3,500 miles an hour. Then just uh, less than a week after launch, it's going 1,600 miles an hour. And then yesterday, it's going about 940 miles an hour. Um, it's going to be over the, it'll still continue to slow down uh, over the next two weeks as it gets to L2 and end up at about 400 miles an hour um, once it uh, reaches there. Um, you can also see some other interesting things here. Um, at six days after launch, it was about halfway there. So the first week it travels uh, about halfway to L2, and the next three weeks it completes the other half. So it also gives you a sense of how much faster it's going at the very beginning. Uh, here's a chart of um, the speed all the way out, starting from 90 minutes after launch. And you can see that it drops off very quickly there in the first two days and then just coasts all the way out. Uh, another way to think about gravity, how it works is that uh, objects in space can be thought of as, uh, as occupying a gravity well, like a water well, but a very deep well that's uh, influenced by gravity. The sun, since it has so much more mass, is a very much deeper well than Earth. And you can see indicated uh, the L1 and L2, uh, the five Lagrange points uh, around the Earth-Sun system. So you could think of the space, spacecraft leaving Earth as climbing up and out of a gravity well. And I like to think of it too as, you know, it's almost like, it's like rolling a ball up a very, very steep hill where you have to... It's going very fast in the beginning, and as it's climbing the hill, it's going slower and slower and slower, and rolling the ball up the hill with just enough energy for it to, to reach the, the other side and go over. So um, that's, that's a fascinating thing uh, to me about how spacecraft travel in space. Um, if you're interested in, in learning more, um, our friends at the SETI Institute have produced a free booklet uh, that uh, I encourage you all to take a look at. If you'd like to find out more about the telescope and how it's working, I'm going to paste a link for that in the chat right now. And I'm going to finish out with this tweet that, uh, or this email announcement that came in from NASA just 45 minutes ago, announcing uh, the major milestone of uh, the final deployment. So um, they fully deployed the 21 foot uh, primary mirror and uh, all those complex steps that caused a lot of worry for everyone in the team. Um, it's really thousands, tens of thousands of people all, all over the world that have been working on the Webb telescope. Um, uh, companies from 25 or 30 different states all supplied components and expertise uh, for construction. Uh, it's really a, a massive effort. Um, I'm going to finish now um, and go on to Q&A. Um, and while we're on q and I'm going to stop sharing uh, this window. And then I'm going to paste into the chat uh, the lo uh, a location where you could follow uh, in real time where the web telescope is right now. So uh, you can also find this site uh, very easily by doing a search for where's web. And uh, let's see where it's at right now. So this is live from NASA. Um, you can see the launch lapse time is about 14 days plus. Uh, and the telescope's approaching three quarters of the way out to the Lagrange point two. And um, it just uh, completed the, the starboard side primary mirror wing. Uh, so now uh, that's fully deployed and launched. What's fun about this site is you have an option of time versus distance. So this graph in the middle is showing the number of days that uh, Webb is going to take to get to L2. It's about 30 days. 
and it's indicating that we're about 14 days into it. Uh, you can see uh, that it passed the moon after about two days. Um, you can also switch this to distance scale. So in terms of distance, uh, the web is almost three quarters of the way there. And the moon was about uh, a quarter of the way. So it's about four times uh, as far away as the moon. And I think I'll just let this, uh, let this screen uh, go uh, while we look at some Q&A. And so, okay, so our first question is, um, will James Webb's time overlap with Spitzer be utilized for infrared uh, symmetry? Oh, um, I'm sh let's see, I'm not sure if it's gonna overlap with Spitzer. I, I'm, I'm not sure that Spitzer might be decommissioned now. Um, let's see, maybe I'll take a quick look here. And, uh, Yes, but for sure, scientists always like to have overlap with different instruments. And we'll do that if they can. It will for sure overlap with Hubble, uh, although Hubble's seeing uh, a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, but they'll always want to complement observations from one and another. Um, so let's see, Spitzer was retired. Yeah, Spitzer was retired in January, 2020. So uh, I don't think that's in, in use anymore. Um, Spitzer was one of NASA's uh, great observatories. So thanks for that one. So the next one is, when are we expecting results from James Webb telescope? Uh, summer. So they expect to have first uh, images released maybe late June, early July. Uh, so one mention of people thinking, oh, you know, maybe since we launched on Christmas, we'll get first images on July 4th, uh, keeping up the holiday theme. So uh, there's a lot of steps that, that need to happen, including like what I talked about, uh, aligning the mirrors so that they're working uh, in uniform uh, and all together. And there's also calibration of uh, the, the science instruments, the four instruments uh, and the backside of the telescope. And Part of the reason they're waiting for that is they're waiting for those for, for the telescope to get out to the L2 point and give uh, those instruments time to cool down to their uh, very cold operating temperatures. Helps, helps when I unmute myself. So <laughs> what are the impacts of so much man-made reflectiveness in space? Um, how is that measure, measured or tracked? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that impact uh, spacecraft uh, that are around Earth. There's you know, heat energy, there's reflected light, uh, there's radio waves, there's radio interference. Um, one of the things you may have seen in the news lately is that, is that SpaceX is launching this constellation of thousands of uh, Starlink satellites that would provide internet services to remote areas of the globe. Unfortunately, the early versions of those had a, a, a component that reflected sunlight back down to Earth, and they were inter it was interfering with astronomers' observations of the sky. So the observation, the astron astronomical community came back to SpaceX and says, "Hey, you're, you've created all these things moving through our sky, and, it, and it's interfering with our, our work." And SpaceX actually went back and redesigned and, uh, the, the the Starlink satellites and. Um, that's, that's definitely a problem. And as you see more and more uh, spacecraft launched into Earth orbit, um, it's not just reflectiveness, but crowdedness. And that, uh, you know, if you have a collision between two satellites, it creates a debris cloud of, you know, thousands of pieces. And that, that could just cascade uh, to some real problems. Okay. And then someone's asking, can you share where Hubble is compared to Webb? Yeah, so Hubble's in Earth orbit, uh, a little higher than the space station. It's actually very, very high orbit. They want to keep it you know, as far away as they can. Um, so while uh, Hubble 
might be around 400 miles uh, above the surface of the Earth. Uh, the web will be a million miles, so much farther away. Um, and one of the interesting things about Hubble is just pointing it. I mean, it's, it's traveling so fast around the Earth, you've got to have very precise uh, instrumentation that, that could keep Hubble uh, pointed at, you know, whatever target it's looking at. And, you know, Hubble's, Hubble's been uh, in orbit, uh, you know, 30 years plus now. And uh, I said some great science. So I know it had a few glitches late last year, had to be offline for a while. Um, so it's reaching the end of its, its useful life, but it's still going. Okay, and then um, can you explain how L2 comes to be and where, where what is it between? Yeah, sure. Um, let me mention one more thing about Hubble too. Uh, it was old, it was less than a hundred years ago that Edwin Hubble, uh, the astronomer, discovered that uh, these gray fuzzy things that they were seeing in the sky were not part of the Milky Way, and that they were actually other galaxies. So this is the late nineteen twenties, um, and it's incredible to me that we've gotten such deeper understanding in less than 100 years. We've gone from thinking that uh, everything we see in the sky was in our galaxy and the galaxy was everything in the universe to now we're using uh, telescopes and Hubble and Webb to examine things that are like an enormous scale, an uncomprehensible distance um, behind, you know, beyond uh, just our galaxy itself. So, uh, Interesting things. So how how did L two come to be? So there was there was a, a theoretician I think uh, named Lagrange who actually saw I think he solved these uh, <clears throat> had the discovery of these points you know and, and solved mathematically you know in, in, in theory first before uh, you know they knew before they were able to actually you know send a spacecraft out there to uh, have it have it verify. So uh, it was really uh, Lagrange who discovered them. And the L1 is between Earth and the Sun. L2 is out in, in line of Earth and Sun, but um, away from uh, the Sun. Uh, L3 is on the opposite side of the Sun from Earth. And L4 and 5 are like in the diagrams, a little bit ahead, a little bit behind in uh, Earth's orbit. Okay. <gasps> Is the scientific instrument plate something like a um, deuterium? I'm not sure about that. The the different scientific instruments before them are, there's an imaging, uh, they're gonna image an infrared, there's a spectrometer, um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, what those, uh, what those, like those, the plates that actually kind of receive the final light uh, are made of, but I, th I would guess that Many of them, or maybe all of them, are more like a CCD sensor that you have in a camera. I, th I think they're, uh, which would be like for visual, visible light, but uh, might be something different for infrared. I'm not sure about that. Okay, so um, after the James Webb telescopes, are we preparing another more powerful telescope? I mean, of course, technology is, is, technology is developing and we want to learn more and more about space, but are we preparing more specific, um, something more specific right now, do you know? Yes, uh, in, in, in like doing my, assembling my slides for this project, I found, uh, I, was looking, I was trying to compare the size of the Hubble Space Telescope mirror, which is about two and a half meters to the, uh, the web, which is, uh, 20 feet, it's like six meters, it's like three times the size. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's actually drawings of, of another even bigger mirror that uh, is under, I don't know how far it is under development, it might just be an idea right now. But um, yeah, there's always, 
a quest to 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 find out more. Okay, and if someone's asking, why isn't the media covering this more? Um, it's a very significant event. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't answer why the media covers <laughs> what it does, but yeah, I mean, it's it is a significant event, and you know, it's a leap forward in our understanding of the universe and. Um, I, th I think it kind of depends too on what on what media you're watching. You know, I, I subscribe to news from NASA and uh, you know uh, a, a couple of newsletters that come out uh, you know regularly. So it's it's pretty easy to keep up on space news uh, uh, if if you look if you look for it. So yeah, I've always like always like to see uh, more coverage and understanding. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you all for for joining here. It's great uh, to. Uh, to, to share this excitement. So the next question is, what will James Webb's first targets be? Um, it's first going to use uh, some very bright stars to help it align the mirrors. Um, but beyond that, they do have the entire first year uh, scheduled. And I'm actually not sure what's on that list. Um, I think some of it they're keeping secret. Uh, someone was saying this morning in, in, the, uh, in the NASA live feed. Um, so other than using uh, a star for, you know, stars for alignments, uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think you'll see things in all those components, uh, galaxies, probably galaxies and, and things that are, that are more known rather than kind of searching empty space to see what's there. Uh, I think you may have answered this one, but it's um, someone ask, is asking about the L2 again. How does that happen if there's no mass to orbit around at L2? Oh, so yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to have mass at the L2 to have an orbit. It's just a balance of gravitational forces between, in this case, the, the sun and the earth. And these those two gravitational force from the from the sun and earth zero each other out they're equal um, and because they're equal like that um, any spacecraft can essentially just hang out there without and as earth's going in its orbit around the sun uh, the telescope will stay there with it um, and that enables earth to always be in, in contact with it so the, the the, the L2, the, the space, all the spacecraft at L2, just they, they'll be going around the, um, the sun along with the Earth and do an orbit every year. So it's, it's, uh, it's a unique uh, and really beneficial uh, location and circumstance. Um, someone's asking, will the James Webb's data be publicly available? Yes, um, that's that's one of the one of the hallmarks of, of NASA and of science and the way they do science uh, throughout all the NASA uh, missions. Um, some I think some scientists hold me to my holdbacks some of their data, but generally most everything uh, is released. Uh, maybe not at first, but at some point. Um, it's a very diplomatic uh, process that they have for giving astronomers observation time on the Webb telescope and most every telescope around the world. Um, they just put out a blanket announcement. Uh, someone in the NASA was just talking about it this morning. If you'd like to, if you have something you'd like us to use Webb to observe, then tell us what it is. And there's a, there's a peer review of a group of people that that uh, judge which are the most valuable of those uh, submissions, and uh, they they slot those people in for observation time. And it's uh, you know it could be from universities uh, anywhere in the world, uh, it could be from companies or research institutes. Uh, it's really a great part of science in that it's it's shared worldwide and uh, you know made public. Um, you know, for one, NASA makes available all the images uh, from the Juno spacecraft that's orbiting Jupiter. And if you want to, they really encouraged in the last few years uh, citizen scientists 
uh, uh, members of the public uh, to go in and said, here's all the pictures from Jupiter, go check them out. And if you want to draw conclusions for them, if you want to process them to make them uh, look interesting, please do and please share it. So uh, I think maybe not right away, but we'll see some sort of uh, webs data out there for us. So uh, this is a good question. Will it observe black holes? That's a great question. Thanks, Catherine. Um, will it observe black holes? Not directly because you can't see them, but it'll observe. I would. I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, exactly, but I would think that some of the circumstances and effects of black holes are some of the things that they'll be looking at. Christine asks, um, might the James Webb um, make any discoveries about the nature of dark matter or dark energy? Yeah, dark matter and dark energy is, is like the, the biggest uh, mysteries uh, about the universe. And, you know, the, the, the universe is acting in ways that we can't explain. So uh, it's, it's, it's kind of categorized because it must be this force, this dark force or matter and energy that, that we can't see that's, that's uh, moving things. Um, and I would guess, yes, that, that um, part of Webb's mission would, would help would help with solving both of those two. Although I haven't seen anything specifically outlined in Webb's objectives that, that addresses dark matter or dark energy directly. Someone's asking, what kind of cameras are on the telescope? So there are four instruments. Um, and I don't, uh, I don't know exactly what kinds of imaging cameras there are. Uh, I'm gonna look it up. Um, <clears throat> so there's uh, the four main instruments. There's near infrared camera. Uh, there's near infrared spectrograph. Uh, mid-infrared instrument and uh, near-infrared imager uh, and then slitless spectrograph. So two spectrograph. Um, so looking more at the near-infrared camera, it's covering you know a certain part of the infrared wavelength, 0 0.6 to 5 microns, uh, and detecting light from earlier stars and, and galaxies. So Beyond that, uh, I'm not sure. Offhand. Okay. So, um, are there plans for a second James Webb telescope? Um, will the how will the new technology of the JW help advance and the development of new technologies? Um, I don't think there's plans for a second web. Uh, you know, like we talked about, probably I think the next step would be a, an even larger space telescope to extend that understanding even deeper in the universe, um, kind of like uh, Webb is pushing uh, Hubble's observations uh, much farther back. And then, yes, all these technologies that we talked about um, contribute to, um, you know, not just other telescopes, but to, you know, any kind of science instruments in other ways uh, here on Earth. You know, they, just, the, uh, just the motors that, that move each of the individual mirror segments uh, were, had to be uniquely designed to operate <clears throat> uh, not just at the super cold temperatures, but also in, in tiny, tiny, tiny fractions uh, of an amount, like less than the, way less than the width of a human hair. So all those motors can move in multiple axes, and like the tiniest bit of motion. <clears throat> And yeah, I think that that kind of technology can you know branches out into other science and even you know things you know more common things that we use here on Earth. Someone in the chat had a really good question about um, that you can see in the slide like the slide we're looking at the um, the extreme temperatures. Um, why does the cold side not get any colder um, since the shield had was deployed fully deployed? Yeah, um, 
who took it down. Because we can see the cold side and hot side here on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think the cold side actually settles down colder uh, as it gets farther out there. Um, I think over time um, that cold, those colder temperatures, uh, those, those temperatures were actually warmer. So I'm looking back at my slides. Uh, you know, a week ago, the cold side was minus 230, and now it's minus 330. So, um, you know, over time, that'll, that'll, those will get a little colder. And those, those are two, those, they're getting those measurements from two different sensors in different locations. So one's in, obviously in a little colder place than the one that's running now at minus 278. So the next one is, um, will we ever be able to move the telescope to an alternate location to peer elsewhere? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's staying at L2 and it's not going to go anywhere else. Um, but because it's going to follow Earth's orbit around the sun, over the course of the year, it's going to be able to deserve, observe the entire sky. So um, that was one uh, benefit of having it out at L2 is that with the sun shielded, um, oh, you, you will be able to see, you know, higher sphere of our sky. Someone's asking, what's the life expectancy of the telescope? Oh, I think they're thinking, you know, five to 10 years at least. Uh, I don't know what Hubble started at, but it's been going 30 years. Yeah. Um, the limiting uh, part of for web is going to be the fuel and uh, they need fuel to point it um, and uh, keep it oriented uh, in the direction that they want it to be um, so it's like like I said the uh, the precise launch helped a lot and it's and it's going to extend its light so uh, I, I think five to ten years hopefully more probably not more than 15 or 20. Okay, and then some, someone's asking, is each mirror segment also concave? Yeah, each, each mirror uh, has a, a curve to it. Um, and, uh, and looking at the mirrors, uh, there, there's, I think, three sets that each have different curves. So um, they were polished to, um, you know, a very, a very shallow depth. Uh, so yeah, each 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 mirror has a concavity to it. I love this question. Which direction does Webb have to be to aim to to, uh, <laughs> yeah. to aim at to see the early stages of the Big Bang? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, anywhere, um, you know the 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 image from Nature magazine showing the Big Bang there earlier was a little misleading in that it kind of got you to think that. Um, you had to look in one direction of the universe. But uh, one of the NASA people today was that uh, you look anywhere in the universe and you're seeing farther and farther back. Um, that's a little bit of a mind bender and a little hard to, to, to comprehend, but um, you, you look in any direction and you're, and you're seeing farther and farther away. I think really you can think that the Big Bang comes from everywhere around us and not in any certain direction. Okay, so then um, he was asking about the, um, what he meant about the orbit of L2 was a small orbit. Is that to avoid the Earth's shadow? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what you're looking specifically about that, but um, yeah, that the orbit around the L2 is, uh, it's actually kind of close to the size of the moon's orbit around the Earth, uh, was one, one thing that I read. Um, so, See what was Robert's prior question? Can I see that? Yeah, you're asking about the mass at L2. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's in that small orbit uh, to stay out of Earth's shadow. 
and also I think to compensate because it's 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 being influenced by other gravitational forces too. It's not just Earth and Sun, but Jupiter's gravity affects it. Uh, Mars is, Mars has a, a smaller you know, gravitational component that affects it. Um, okay, um, if we get results, um, get the results we want from James Webb, what is going to be our next scientific step? Are we going to have to um, have the answer to the big questions of the universe? Some will have a lot more information about that. I mean, it's by seeing early, early, early galaxies, you know, galaxies at younger ages than we've ever been able to see before and stars at younger ages, uh, astronomers will, will, will have a better idea of how uh, the galaxies came to be and how the universe formed. So, yeah, that's and it won't happen all right all right away. That's 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 a multi year process uh, for many scientists. Um, but uh, hey, that's why they do, that's why they do this is is to answer those those big questions. Okay, and then someone's asking, how can residents' problems um, solved if observing the age and relevance? I'm not sure. Maybe black holes. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. The resonance problems be solved. Uh, I'm not sure what that means, like the resonance, the motion of the telescope, uh, because they're moving it. So mm -hmm. um, they are moving it to point a different object, but then when they want to look at something, they stop. But it's still moving, you know, probably thousands of miles an hour in, uh, in its orbit. I mean, Earth travels about 67,000 miles an hour in its orbit around the sun. So Webb, since it's farther away, it's probably even faster. Um, so yeah, you can have some, in, you could have some vibration uh, that's caused um, by moving it. But one of the, one of the breakthroughs of the back plane that we saw a picture of earlier, it's incredibly stiff. It's incredibly stiff at, at these lowest temperatures. They're saying that it's it it stays absolutely solid, fixed uh, to like uh, fractions of a width of a human hair. So um, they they solve uh, that in the design. I would say. Okay. How will scientists from Earth communicate with the telescope? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, the Deep Space Network. Uh, if you look up DSN, the massive DSN, the Deep Space Network, uh, there are uh, radio antennas in three locations around the Earth, equally spaced, one in Goldstone, California, one in Canberra, Australia, and one in Spain. And there's those dishes uh, were built in the, in the 60s and have been used to talk to all the spacecraft. Uh, and all the space missions uh, beyond Earth. Uh, at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, there's a deep space mission, there's a control room where all the communications with uh, not just Webb, but the orbiters on Mars, the rovers on Mars, which talk through the orbiters, uh, the Voyager 1, Voyager 2 spacecraft, uh, they all run through uh, those radio dishes. There's three big ones at those three locations, and then you know two or three smaller ones at each of those three locations that coordinate all these data, all the commands that go out, all the data that comes in from all, all the spacecraft, uh, mostly all, all the spacecraft that are beyond Earth orbit, and most of the, the spacecraft in Earth orbit uh, don't don't run through the DSN. Uh, if you want to see what's happening with that, uh, do start, go to the website called DSN Now, uh, Deep Space Network Now. We'll, we'll show you in real time um, which antennas are talking to which spacecraft. It's a cool site. I'll, uh, I'll patch a link in the in the chat here. Let's see. This looks like it. We're talking to Web now. Anyway, uh, let's go on to the last questions. 
Okay, and then um, at which wavelengths will it observe? Uh, the infrared, near infrared, infrared and near infrared. So near infrared and mid infrared. So uh, it's going to be observing outside the visible uh, visible wavelength. Uh, and that's because as it's observing visible light, but because of the expansion of space, that visible light has shifted into the infrared. And that's why it needed to um, be that this, the web needs to be at, at such a super cool temperature uh, uh, that they can get uh, far away from Earth. So is it possible to send astronauts to repair or maintain the telescope? Uh, hey, Ken, um, thanks for the question. Uh, no, um, you know, that's there, unlike the Hubble that got uh, visited five times for, for repairs and equipment upgrades. Um, Web is out there and it's staying there and it's all, uh, it's on its own. I mean, um, is it possible that after the James Webb discoveries of about 13.8 billion years ago, the laws of physics will change? Will quantum physics play a part in this and what happens, of course? <laughs> well, let's see, I'm not a physicist, so seems to me like those laws of physics are pretty well fixed, although they might have better definitions of, of certain things, uh, thanks to web, better understanding a certain part. And the quantum physics, yeah, I'm not sure if the kinds of things that web will be discovering will influence our understanding of quantum physics. I think that comes more from particle accelerators and things. So there was one question, I think you'd answered it. Somebody was asking, would it observe exoplanets? Hmm. Yeah, it's gonna observe exoplanets uh, as they transit in front of their stars. So from what I understand, it's not gonna observe the exoplanets directly because uh, it's very difficult to do because uh, stars are such a long way away, even though planets might have an orbit that's far away from their sun. The light from the sun is so bright that you can't really look at the planet by itself. But as the, as the planet crosses in front of, the, of their sun, um, Webb will be able to see the chemical composition in ways that uh, we can't see right now. So they'll be able to look at atmospheres and say, okay, you know, there's oxygen there, or there's methane or other things, and uh, draw conclusions about um, you know, what's in the atmosphere or other planets. And you know, they figure on finding some that are very much like Earth, which will be really exciting. I don't know if they'd ever be able to, uh, to image like the kind of electromagnetic radiation that would indicate intelligent life for TV signals or anything though. I think it's more just chemical composition. That was the next question. <laughs> Someone's asking where we'll be pointing at, but also if they would be able to, to see signals from advanced civilization. So. Yeah, I don't think they'll be able to see signals, although they might see, you know, chemical uh, compounds or conditions uh, that would indicate uh, you know, that there's something living there and maybe, you know, maybe even machines. Um, watch a lecture from Seth Shostak uh, from the SETI Institute a while ago. And one of the things that surprised me about what he said was that they were thinking that our discovery of extraterrestrial life, you know, won't be from living things like organisms like us, but from machines. And that we're more likely to find a machine uh, that's communicating with us or sending out signals uh, because machines can travel through space, they can repair themselves, they could live for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. Um, uh, so that seems to be, uh, you know, what we might be more most likely to encounter from another you know, intelligent civilization. I mean, that's really the, the last of it. The last two where I'm not really 100% sure off. You can see that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I could see some of them there. Thanks for, thanks for hand, uh, 
I'll fun agree with those, uh, Franklin. And I guess we'll close off. So uh, congratulations, everybody. We got a new telescope. It's up and running. And I'm looking forward to seeing what it sends back for us. And thanks for all your questions and for joining us today. Uh, you know, I think Franklin will have you'll have this on YouTube. Yes, well, we'll have it on YouTube later today, and everybody who attended and everybody who registered will get a, a link to the actual recording. So, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Thank you again, Ron, for sharing this wonderful information, and we'll see you guys soon. Thanks. Bye, yep. everybody. Thanks. Bye.